Jordan Peterson is famously critical of ideology. He has a particular disdain for Marxism, Stalinism, Nazism, postmodernism, feminism, in fact, any ism. Instead, he argues that the individual is sovereign, ideology should be renounced, and that, quote, if we each live properly, we will collectively flourish. Today, we're going to examine Peterson's charge against ideology ask what ideology really is and why it's often misunderstood, what Peterson's ideology is, what his ideology leaves out, and finally we'll look at why we need ideology. So what does Jordan Peterson mean by ideology? Rule 6 of Peterson's second book, Beyond Order, is Abandon Ideology. Drawing on Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky, Peterson interprets ideology as being rigid, comprehensive, utopian, and predicated on a few apparently self-evident axioms. An ism theorist, he argues, generates a small number of explanatory principles or forces that can supposedly explain everything, all the past, all the present, and all the future. An ideologue, he continues, grants these small number of forces primary causal power while ignoring others of equal or greater importance. The result of this is that an ideologue can consider himself or herself in possession of the complete truth. He writes, they adopt a single axiom. Government is bad, immigration is bad, capitalism is bad, patriarchy is bad. Then they filter and screen their experiences and insist ever more narrowly that everything can be explained by that axiom. They believe, narcissistically, underneath all that theory, that the world can be put right if only they held the controls. He says that there is no claim more totalitarian. And while warning against the dangers of totalitarianism and the idea of an unreachable promised utopia, he also includes those who, quote, maintain faith in the commonplace isms characterising the modern world, conservatism, socialism, feminism, and all manner of ethnic and gender study isms, postmodernism, environmentalism, among others. But notice he includes conservatism here, too. And you might think, well, it's all the right-wing psychologists. It's like, all the right-wing psychologists are in this room, sitting in this chair. <laughs> but we'll ignore the seeming contradiction for a moment, because I want to try to be charitable. Let's look at how Peterson's critique has three parts. That ideology is utopian, ideology is simplistic, and ideology is driven by resentment. First, utopianism is unachievably idealistic. He writes, let us not get too grandiose. We can design systems that allow us a modicum of peace, security and freedom, and perhaps the possibility of incremental improvement. That is a miracle in and of itself. And the second charge is that ideology is too low resolution, simplifying the world and ignoring the nuance while focusing narrowly on those small numbers of explanatory forces. Those forces might be the patriarchy, the rich, the oppressors, etc. He writes, their use of single terms implicitly hypersimplifies what are in fact extraordinarily diverse and complex phenomena. For Marx, for example, he says, everything can be explained by running it through a Marxist algorithm. He says this is attractive to faux theorists, incompetent and corrupt intellectuals, smart but lazy people, pseudo-intellectuals, and fundamentalists, and he says they're monotheists. Instead, he says, ideology should be renounced, and we should remember that all such problems require careful, particularised analysis, followed by the generation of multiple potential solutions, followed by the careful assessment of those solutions to ensure that they are having the desired effect. It's uncommon to see any serious social problem addressed so methodically. 
And finally, Peterson criticizes ideologues because they're motivated by resentment of the rich or the powerful, rather than by sympathy for the poor or oppressed. He says, when someone claims to be acting from the highest principles for the good of others, there's no reason to assume that the person's motives are genuine. When it's not just naivety, the attempt to rescue someone is often fueled by vanity and narcissism. So Peterson has three general charges against ideologues. First, they oversimplify the world, an empirical problem. Second, they're utopian and optimistic, a possibility problem. And third, they're motivated by resentment, a motivational problem. We'll return to this at the end. But first, what do philosophers say ideology is? Okay, so what is ideology? It's most commonly associated with Marxism, the far left or the far right, maybe with Nazis, maybe with the Soviet Union, sometimes with Black Lives Matter. A quick glance is enough to tell us that it's frankly an ambiguous term. As a concept though, ideology is resolutely modern. It emerged as a result of the English, American and French revolutions, the scientific revolution and the rigorous study of the world, and could only be communicated because of the rise of the printing press. At its simplest, an ideology is a worldview, a system of belief, a map of meaning. But when you look at how philosophers have defined the term, it's difficult to find much agreement. Frankfurt School theorist Theodore Adorno defined ideology as simply an organisation of opinions, attitudes and values, a way of thinking about man and society. Political scientist Karl Lowenstein argued that it's a consistent integrated pattern of thoughts and beliefs explaining man's attitude towards life and his existence in society and advocating a conduct and action pattern responsive to and commensurate with such thoughts and beliefs. The philosopher Martin Seliger has written that ideologies are sets of ideas by which men posit, explain and justify ends and means means of organised social action, and specifically political action, irrespective of whether such action aims to preserve, amend, uproot or rebuild a given social order. Some have defined it critically, like political scientist Giovanni Satori. He says it's typically dogmatic and rigid and impermeable. But in an overview of the literature, philosopher John Gehring has argued that the definition is so contested that they only really have one thing in common, coherence. Ideologies are sets of ideas or values that are defined by their coherence and consistency. They're integrated into a system of logic. Ideologies often guide thought, language, behaviour and action. They're a rough map that organises a view of the world, motivating us to perform actions, make arguments, make value judgments and behave maybe in certain ways. In this way, we might have an ideological approach to cooking or sports as much as politics and morality. But one misunderstanding many people have is the idea that ideology is anything but reality, the present or the status quo. Many often miss how the present has an ideological basis as much as Marxism or feudalism or post-feminist anarcho-Jupiterism. As Adorno wrote, reality becomes its own ideology through the spell cast by its faithful duplication. It might be contested and vary from place to place, liberal, neoliberal, nationalist, federalist maybe, but our world views are the product of ideologies theorised by thinkers like John Locke, John Stuart Mill, Montesquieu, the founding fathers of America, the list goes on. The ideologies we live in become more difficult to see because, like fish in water, we swim in them.
So if ideology is just a coherent and consistent set of ideas, we might say that Peterson's criticism is not with ideology per se, but with dogmatic ideology, ideas that become too rigid. So let's look at the coherent and consistent set of ideas guiding behaviour in Peterson's ideology, what I'll call a kind of mythic conservatism. As I examined in the last video, the foundation of Peterson's ideology is the sovereignty of the individual as primary and, as we'll look at now, a type of conservative Judeo-Christian mythic structuralism alluded to throughout Twelve Rules for Life and Beyond Order and more academically in Maps of Meaning. Peterson's ideology goes something like this. He says, first, arrangements must be made for our provisioning with the basic requirements of life. We need food, shelter, water, etc. Second, he says, it's worth considering more deeply just how necessity limits the universe of viable solutions and implementable plans. This is because, first, it must in principle solve some real problem, second, it must appeal to others, third, it must work for me, my family and the broader community, and four, it must work today, tomorrow, next month, next year. The idea, he says, is that these universal constraints, manifest biologically and imposed socially, reduce the complexity of the world to something approximating a universally understandable domain of value. He continues, The fact of limited solutions implies the existence of something like a natural ethic. Variable, perhaps, as human languages are variable, but still characterised by something solid and universally recognisable at its base. So the way we, as humans, approach problems, relationships and the world is limited. If it's limited, it becomes natural, solid, in tune with our biology and our social life, and so becomes universalistic because it's repeated over and over by past generations, because it works and there are apparently no alternatives. This natural ethic emerges in rules, in myths, in our everyday behaviour, in stories and films. Remember that Peterson's primary critique of ideology is that it's dogmatic. Well, the dictionary definition of dogmatic is inclined to lay down principles as undeniably true. OK, but what are some of these limited and universal rules? That it must solve some real problem, must appeal to others and work for me, my family and the broader community and must work throughout time, this seems quite unlimited. Well, first, he says we can see them in the Ten Commandments, which Peterson writes are the most influential rules of the game ever formulated, the bedrock of our culture. He says, it's worthwhile thinking of these commandments as a minimum set of rules for a stable society, an iterable social game. The rules can be seen more broadly throughout Judaism and Christianity, which as a doctrine elevated the individual soul, placing slave and master and commoner and nobleman alike on the same metaphysical footing, rendering them equal before God and the law. Christianity insisted that even the king was only one among many. He says that Christianity made explicit the surprising claim that even the lowliest person had rights, genuine rights. In Christianity, we can see the development of the sovereign individual, but more than this, we see archetypes that are repeated throughout history in universal myths like the hero's journey, the importance of sacrifice, and the idea that order is masculine and chaos is feminine. He writes, These ideas are also encapsulated and represented in the narratives, the fundamental narratives that sit at the base of our culture, these stories, whatever their ultimate metaphysical significance, are at least in part a consequence of our watching ourselves act across eons of human history and distilling from that watching the essential patterns of our actions. Peterson is describing a type of structuralism, that there are universal structures that explain and at least somewhat determine human behaviour, 
The structure is part of our very makeup, and myths, he says, speak to something we know, but do not know that we know. The golden rule, for example, do to others what you would have them do to you, is found repeatedly across cultures and throughout history. The Exodus story is archetypal, he says, because it cannot be improved upon. Let my people go, hardship, tyranny. It's a narrative that's been identified with throughout history, for example, in slave-owning America. Or the idea or image of a dragon, the worst imaginable combination of creatures, fire, snakeskin, teeth, and it guards a great treasure that can only be slain with heroic courage. He discusses The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, Pinocchio, The Lion King, Iron Man, all conforming to these structural myths. Okay, first, what Peterson's described here is ideological. If we return to our definitions of ideology, it fits the bill. To take one example, in a comparative study of ideology, political scientist Mustada Rege has said that ideology is an emotion-laden, myth-saturated, action-related system of beliefs and values about people and society, legitimacy and authority that's acquired to a large extent as a matter of faith and habit. The myths and values of ideology are communicated through symbols in a simplified, economical and efficient manner. Sound familiar? So critiquing ideologues and ideology, while advocating for a type of conservative Judeo-Christian structuralism is a contradiction at best, and hypocritical too. And in some places, the cognitive dissidence is comical. He critiques ideologues for being dogmatic, then writes that it's therefore necessary and desirable for religions to have a dogmatic element. What good is a value system that does not point the way to a higher order? And what good can you possibly be if you cannot or do not internalise that structure or accept that order, not as a final destination, necessarily, but at least as a starting point? He says this despite everything he said in the chapter of Renounce Ideology, about it being too low resolution, simplistic, fundamentalist, and being run through a hyper-simplified algorithm. It's no different just because he's found his ideas in stories of the past. This is why Peterson's a conservative, because his ideological ideas, those dogmatic principles, are found in the timeless wisdom of the past. They're unchanging, limited, eternal, and so don't really need improving on that much. He's a type of Burkean traditionalist conservative, named after the father of modern conservatism Edmund Burke. Burke wrote that conservatism is an approach to human affairs which mistrusts both a priori reasoning and revolution, preferring to put its trust in experience and in the gradual improvement of tried and tested arrangements. As Peterson writes, it's the reality of this natural ethic that makes thoughtless degeneration of social institutions both wrong and dangerous, because those institutions have evolved to solve problems that must be solved for life to continue. They're by no means perfect, but making them better rather than worse is a tricky problem indeed. There's an odd tension here. On the one hand, eternal, natural, universal, limited rules are to be found in the past, while on the other hand, there's the acknowledgement that they might need improving and changing. If structuralism is the idea that there's a universal, eternal, unchanging, limited set of rules to human experience and behaviour, post-structuralism argues that these rules are in fact unstable, subject to change and reinterpretation, and Peterson's limited rules seem so ambiguous, so diverse and varied across cultures and history, that it seems questionable to call them limited at all. As Peterson himself writes, our knowledge of how to act in the world remains eternally incomplete, partly because of our profound ignorance of the vast unknown, 
partly because of our willful blindness, and partly because the world continues, in its entropic manner, to transform itself unexpectedly. He continues that human beings are, after all, seriously remarkable creatures. We have no peers, and it's not clear that we have any real limits. Or as he says here... You know, because look, there's, there's nothing that's not within our grasp now, Russell, as a, as, a, as a species. We can do whatever we want. Now we have to figure out what we should do. And then we have to figure out how to communicate that in a way that's motivating to everyone, so everyone's on board. So again, there's a tension here. On the one hand, he's dogmatic, while on the other, the rules and archetypes he examines are broad enough and ambiguous enough to be almost infinitely reinterpretable. The golden rule, the hero's journey, the dragon, sacrifice, as our continual ability to tell new stories, film new films, write new novels, testifies, we are able to interpret the world in significantly new ways. The point is that new stories always emerge that can call into question stereotypes like the heroic individual being primary. This belief in particular, and the way he interprets it, informs his conviction that collectivism is bad, despite, for example, the fact that many of the unprecedented improvements in things like public health, sewers, vaccinations and technology throughout history have been social, collective and governmental, rather than individual, efforts. It's these ideological and subjective biases in his beliefs that means he comes down on the side of order, conservatism, Christianity, mythicism if that's a thing, because the timeless truths are again, according to Peterson, limited. They can be seen in lobsters, in biology, in hierarchies of competence, because, as he writes, there is little evidence that any of us have the genius to create ourselves ex nihilo, from nothing. There's a bias in favour of past wisdom, at the expense of future innovation, creativity, change. Ideology, as we saw through our definitions, has never been defined by its ability to create something from nothing. But progressive ideologies, and let's face it, this is what Peterson is primarily criticising here in today's current context, do want to change what's not working. So let's return to Peterson's initial charges and explore why we need ideology. OK, first, the charge that it's utopian. I agree. Anyone that thinks a rigid implementation of a Marxist revolution or a retreat to a feminist island will solve all of society's problems is misguided. But still, this doesn't mean you shouldn't have some set of ideas about how to make the world a better place. Which brings us to the second charge. Is this dogmatic? Well, actually, I think Peterson has a point here. Moral rigidity and dogmatic thinking is foolish, to say the least. Intellectual humility and openness is, I think, integral. But within any set of ideas, like postmodernism, for example, there are a wide range of positions that are so diverse they can sometimes barely be categorised together. Remember, the definition of dogmatic is inclined to lay down principles as undeniably true, and Peterson makes the claim that his mythic conservatism is based on something like a natural ethic that's universal and manifestly biological. As for ideologues being motivated by resentment, it seems like a suspiciously dogmatic, a priori claim to make. Where's the evidence? It's perfectly possible, as well, to be motivated by ego and empathy, selfishness and virtue, simultaneously. When I give change to a homeless person, am I motivated by resentment of the rich? It's a baseless, odd and cynical assumption that seems at odds with the Christian message Peterson finds so much wisdom in. Rather, than the more obvious motivation 
that some people find it difficult to see others in need and in pain and want to help. It could also quite easily be applied to Peterson. Why is it not the same thing to dismiss him as simply resentful of the powerful leftist postmodern neo-Marxist academics who have overrun the institutions he's spent his life at? Finally, what about the claim that ideology is simplistic and too low resolution? Well, I think this actually tells us a lot about what ideology is and why we need it. I would argue that some ideological language is often used as a simplistic outline, a communicative device, or a basic categorization schema that's used to organise ideas, action and communication. Peterson writes, It's impossible to fight patriarchy, reduce oppression, promote equality, transform capitalism, save the environment, eliminate competitiveness, reduce government, or to run every organisation like a business. Such concepts are simply too low resolution. The necessary detail is simply not there. But what does this mean? How is it impossible to reduce oppression or reduce government, for example? One look at history shows this to be simply demonstrably false. Instead, we might think of simple low-resolution values like the idea of reducing oppression as quick shorthand for organising more complicated beliefs and ideas. It's in this way that the concept ideology functions like a word like house. It's a simple, loose shorthand that omits more complex details like location, contents, residence, how many bedrooms, the colour of the wallpaper. It doesn't mean the details aren't important too. It's necessary to categorise, simplify and communicate ideas in broad ways that omit differences while retaining common features. For example, two feminists might agree on broader goals while disagreeing on specific details. This goes for Marxists, anarchists, postmodernists, and Jungians. Some difference and nuance must be emptied out to conceptualise value systems broad enough to sustain organisation between multiple people. The Republican or Conservative parties have different factions under a broader umbrella, for example. This doesn't mean there aren't more levels of complexity and detail within. I, for example, draw from many ideologies depending on the context or the task at hand, many parts of which I agree with and many I don't. Not to mention that this is a criticism that again could be applied to Peterson's own thinking. The idea that everything can be explained by running it through a Marxist algorithm is a strange attack for someone to make who seems to run a lot through a Jungian algorithm. In fact, all the things he says makes faux theorists and pseudo-intellectuals are justified by reasons that could be applied to his own mythic conservatism, his own psychological beliefs. As Peterson himself says in Book 2, Rule 7, Without clear, well-defined and non-contradictory goals, the sense of positive engagement that makes life worthwhile is very difficult to obtain. Clear goals limit and simplify the world. Finally, renouncing ideology is simply ahistorical. Take just one example, America's founding fathers. They were influenced by Locke and the ideology of natural rights theory that developed in the 17th century. They had their disagreements, but they were united enough on a few central principles to bring their ideological beliefs into fruition. And their ideology is something Peterson seems to identify with, loosely speaking. In fact, it's impossible to make sense of any popular movements. The diggers, the levellers, Calvinists, the sans culottes, civil rights activists, suffragettes, republicans, nationalists, Kamalists, without recourse to the idea of ideology. This leads me to my final point. Ideology seems so common throughout history, comes up time and time again across the globe that it might be understood, not by me, but by some, as archetypal. <laughs>
Well, of course, thank you to all these incredible Patreons for making this video possible. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so through the link below for as little as a dollar. It's the only way I make these videos. Uh, that's enough Jordan Peterson for now, but I am going to look at the history of responsibility um, and tell a more documentarian story uh, about responsibility throughout the 20th and early 21st century, so look out for that. And if you can't support the channel, you can do so by simply clicking subscribe. You're watching the videos in their entirety for the algorithm's sake, of course. Following me on Twitter, hitting like. I'll see you next time.